Abba Father, I just want to thank you for this day. <clears throat> thank you for this time of worship that we have had, my King. Thank you that we know that you are the one whom we can put our trust and our faith in. Thank you that we, are, we know that <clears throat> no matter what comes upon us, no matter what happens, no matter what we face, Father, that you are the one that is with us. You are the one that is going to lead us. You are the one that is going to guide us. You are the one that is going to see us through, no matter the storm, no matter the circumstances. You are the one that is always there. And I thank you, Father, for this time that we have, for this wonderful time of this last ten days of all that we are leading up to, preparing ourselves for Yom Kippur, and then preparing ourselves for the feast of Sukkot, of where we can tabernacle with you and Father, what an awesome time it is. What an awesome time it is to be able to just be in this place where we can just experience your presence in just a different way. And Father, I just want to thank you that um, you are doing a work with each and every one of us. We are all individually different. We all have a different DNA code. Not one is the same as the other. We even, each one of us, have a different frequency None of us has the same frequency. And how amazing it is that you play the strings of our lives so differently, Father. And as we worship you, Father, that the frequency that comes forth from us is a frequency that we can play for you to be able to be exalted, for you to be able to be glorified. What a privilege we have to be able to call ourselves children of the Most High. What a privilege, Father. What a privilege it is for us to be able to be in a place of where we know you. Because if I think of how many people out there don't know you, how many people in this time, in this day and age, and in this time in the world right now are full of fear and anxiety and depression and so many people's Hearts are failing them. There's so many people that I keep hearing of young people that are dying of heart attacks because their hearts will fail them for fear. But Father, we have nothing to fear. The only fear that we are to have is the fear of who you are. It's the fear of Yahuwah that is the beginning of wisdom and we need to fear you and that is all we need to fear. We do not fear the enemy. We do not fear what the enemy does. The only thing that we are to fear is fear you. And so I thank you, Father, that you will continue to do a mighty work in our lives as we continue to seek your face in this, in this time. And especially as we continue with our series of the, the seven species of the land and as we continue to look at this olive and we continue to understand this true anointing and what is the anointing about and and who you are and the anointing is all about you, Yoshua, and that which you have done for us and that which you are still doing within our lives and where you are still <coughs> allowing us to be able to follow you in going to our Gethsemane, to our Garden of Gethsemane and <clears throat> our olive press and where you are having to shake our tree to be able to bring forth the fruit that needs to come forth. And, and so, Father, I just want to thank you that we can just be vessels that we can be in your hand for you to be able to shape and mold and let us be able to come forth as vessels of honor that we can truly be those wise virgins that are going to be able to have oil in our lamps Abba please help us I pray to be able to understand what it truly means to be able to be a a wise virgin from a foolish virgin And so I pray, Father, that you alone will be the one that is going to be able to lead us and guide us and pray. I pray, Father, that you will speak to my mind and speak through my lips the very oracles that you want to speak to be able to open up your word so that we may be able to have the spirit of understanding, so that you will give us the understanding and the revelation of your word for the hour that we are in so that we may be able to come and draw closer to you. I praise and I thank you for this in Yahushua's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Abba. And so we continue with our series as we looked last week at the 
Olive and our this week we're going to be able to go a little bit deeper into understanding this olive tree. We looked at last week as understanding the olive tree as the root is Abba Father. That is the covenant that was made with us. The covenant is made with Abba Father. Abba Father is our very foundation. The one whom we may be able to draw from the root and that is Abba Father. The trunk is Messiah Yeshua. Yeshua is the shoot that is going to come forth. And that we got from Isaiah 11 verse 1. So we've got, he says, Abba says, I am the father, I am Yahuwah of Avram, Yitzhak and Yaakov. So Avram represents Abba, father, the root. Isaac represents the trunk, the Messiah, the shoot that was promised to come forth. Then the branches, the natural branches, they are the they are the the Jews, the Israelites, the Jews. They are the Jews that we can see today, which are the ones representing the house of Yehuda. And according to Romans eleven that we read last week, we saw that there was a wild olive, and that we need to understand that we are this wild olive that has been grafted into the original olive tree, and that is what we would see as being the Gentiles as being the believers that are now being grafted in, those that were without covenant but now are coming back and being grafted into the covenant that was made with the house of Israel. And we are those that are in the dispersion that have been cut off, that was Israel that was cut off, but that we are now being grafted in back into this olive tree, back into the covenant, through the death and resurrection of Yahushua. So, the tree is basically representing the house of Israel, but it's the fullness of the house. And how amazing is Abba, our Father, that once again, here we are at the time of the feasts, and once again, the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda celebrating the feasts on the same calendar again. And so it has been for an entire year, from last year that we celebrated on the day of Yom Teruah, when we entered into Yom Teruah last year, for those in the dispersion that look for the new moon, and for Israel that follows their calendar, yet Abba orchestrated it that we would be on the same calendar. At Pesach, we were on the same calendar this year. And now, again, at Yom Teruah, yeah, they were, yeah, we were spotting the new moon, so they were spotting the new moon in Israel, and according to the calendar that they've already done beforehand, we again celebrated it on the same day. That shows you how the Father is on His throne. That shows you how man can do their thing. But when the Father is releasing a prophetic season, a prophetic time, he's the one who lines it up. It's got nothing to do with man. Man can put their own plans together. Man can do their own things. But when Father is on his throne, he orchestrates things according to his purposes and his plans. Because he's saying, the two sticks will become one house. And there is needing to be a house that needs to raise up. Because we are going to see, according to Ephesians 2, we are going to see that the Father has already ordained this. The Father already planned this. And then we're going to look at Revelation, where the Father has ordained this, that there is only to be 12 tribes of the house of Israel. There are 12 12 gates, 12 tribes. And this is why I say, how is it possible that there is going to be a people if the people are not part of being grafted into a covenant that was made with the house of Israel? Then there is no denominations. There's no gate that says that it's going to be uh, a gate for Presbyterian or for Methodist or for Catholic or for um, New Apostolic or for uh, any of those churches. There is only 12 tribes and we have to be grafted into those 12 tribes. Because if we're not grafted into those 12 tribes, then who are we? We are a branch 
sapping of its own that's not grafted into the original olive tree, that's the house of Israel. And if we are not grafted in, then what are we? A branch sapping of our own which is going to be cut off in the end. And we are going to see that when we're going to get to the wheat. We are going to see that. So, we are going to read from Ephesians 2 so that we may understand what is it that Father has done. What is it about this olive tree? What is it that we've been grafted into? Because we, as the so-called Gentiles, all we've had this understanding is that we've received Yoshua, and then after we've received Yoshua, we are now saved, and we're now going to go to heaven. And this is basically what we've been told. And so now we are this people that have received salvation, but where's the goal? And that's what I've been saying. If we do not have a mission, if we do not have a vision, then what the heck are we doing? Then we're just the saved people, but we are supposed to be making a difference. So let's look and see. And we were dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 from verse 1. And we were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the authority of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, so you see, before we were the sons of disobedience. Now, disobedience or what? The obedient children are those obedient to his ways, obedient to his laws, obedient to his commands. So the children of disobedience are what? The children that were not obedient to his laws, obedient to his commands. Among whom also we all once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, as also the rest. So do you see? We didn't know any better. We were, we were going according to what our flesh desired, to what our flesh wants, and is that not still? If we look at the Christian people, a lot of them still go according to their flesh, and they live according to their flesh. They think according to a fleshly way. They don't follow others' ways. And we need to submit ourselves in our spiritual walk, in our physical walk, in our emotional walk. We need to submit to the Father in all our ways. But Yahuwah, who is rich in compassion, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Messiah. By favor you have been saved. So you see, by favor, we have been saved. Praise the Father for Yeshua being given to us. Because Judah certainly isn't showing us how to come back to the Father with all their customs and their traditions and their ways. And raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenlies in Messiah Yeshua. So you see, now we are those that are seated with him in heavenly places. By us having received him. In order to show in the coming ages the exceeding riches of his favor in kindness towards us in Messiah Yahushua. So you see, in order to show in the coming ages, in the days ahead, the exceeding riches of his favor in kindness towards us in Messiah Yahushua. For by favor you have been saved through belief. So you see, we've been saved by grace through belief. So we have received the belief. And we need to understand belief. Belief is not just that I believed, but belief as an action. I walk it out. Faith without works is dead. You need to walk out your faith. You need to walk out your, your this walk is to be walked out with fear and trembling. Walk out your salvation with fear and trembling is what the word says. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of the Lord. So you see, everybody has received this gift. So nobody's going to have an excuse in the last day to say, but I didn't know. He's going to say, but I gave you my son. I've given you my own. I, I myself has, has been made manifest within you by my Ruach. 
What excuse do you have now to not follow me? Do you understand? It is not by works so that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship. You see, we didn't receive the salvation by our works. Salvation was a free gift. I want you to understand that. Salvation was a free gift that was offered us by Yahushua. He was the way. He was the way. That was the way that was open to us. That's the outer court. We received salvation, a free gift. That was the way. Then we come to the next part of the tabernacle, which is now spirit and truth. This is where we receive the Ruach of Yahuwah. And what is the Ruach of Yahuwah to give us? What is, he's given us his Ruach to bring us back to truth. We have spirit and truth. And that is why in truth, we are to be able to come back to truth. So the Ruach has been given us to bring us back into his truth. He reveals truth to us. Is the spirit of truth. And so, that was a free gift. But then, what does it say? Then we are to be able to sanctification, holiness, set-apartness, is going to cost us, because that's our choice. Salvation was the free gift we received. But now we have to choose to follow him. And that's why we have to choose to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yahushua unto good works, which Allah prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So there are good works that he's already prepared for us, and we are, should walk in that. That's why I always pray and I say, Father, I don't just want to be busy with, with a bunch of things. I want to be busy with the works that you've already pre-planned, pre-ordained before the foundations of the earth for me to walk in. Because I have a book that has been written for my life. And that's the book of the works that I'm supposed to be walking in. Therefore remember that you once nations in the flesh. See? We were nations in the flesh who are called the uncircumcision. So we were of the uncircumcised because we were not of the covenant. But what is called the uncircumcision, what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands. So you see, now we become circumcised by your sure that has been given for us. We are now those grafted in also to the house. That at the time you were without Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel. Do you see? So do you see? If we are not being grafted into the house, into that tree of Israel, then what are we? Do you understand how Christianity, in Christianity we are being we, we, we are being, we missing out of understanding the fullness of what we've been grafted into. So, we were excluded from being citizens of this heavenly kingdom that's got to do with this covenant that has been made. So, we were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no expectation and without allure in the world. So, do you see, we were not part of any covenant. But now we have been made part of this covenant that was given with Israel. So if we are part of that covenant, then whatever is part of that covenant is part of us. And we have to keep that covenant. I rebuke you. For he is our peace, who has made both one and having... Okay, but now in Messiah Yeshua, you once were far off having been brought near by the blood of Messiah. So now we've brought, by the blood of Messiah, we've been brought back. For he is our peace. Do you see? Everything about what we have read about the olive has to do with the peace, which has to do with Yeshua, because Yeshua is the actual tree. And he is our peace, who has made both one. So he made us both one. And having been broken down, the partitions of the barrier... So do you see, there was a barrier between those that were Gentile and between those that were Israel. But now that barrier has been broken down. Now we become one house. There's only one house. There's no, those are the Jews. So Jews are going to be spared. Of, they are going to go through the destruction and the Christians are going to be raptured. There's one house. There's no two houses. You are not separated from them. We are one house. 
And so this is what we need to understand because my people perish for lack of knowledge because we've been taught doctrines of demons. So he says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the Torah of the commands in the dogma. Now that's where your Bibles might not say dogma. So now our Bibles will tell us that having abolished in his flesh the enmity of the commands of the laws, your Bible will say that he has actually, uh, that, that, that they've abolished the law, that's what it will say, so as to create himself one renewed man from the two, thus making peace. That's what some of the Bibles say. What does your Bible say, Elizabeth? Um, verse, 15. verse 15. It says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, of See. commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. So do you so see what peace. you see? So do you see what the Bibles are teaching? The Christians' Bible tell you that he did away with the law and these commands, so that you no longer need to keep it. And now the two of them become one, and they are now they are now the house of Israel, and Yeshua has now made them one. Now, what does the Greek say? Because mine is the Old King James. You see, this of you saying the dogma. Now, I want us to go and have a look at that scripture in the Aramaic because we need to look at the Aramaic now in Aramaic it says in verses 15 listen to what it says and in the flesh the enmity and the regulations of the commands contained in the commandments are abolished that so that it in himself an occurrence of the divine nature of quinoma uh, he might make the two into one abolishing peace now, what it's actually saying, if we go look at, the ex at what they explain about what is being spoken of here, he's saying um, that, oh, sorry, now I just need to find it. Up here. The um, quonoma can mean a curse substance or occurrence that Basically what it is, is the dogma that it's been speaking of is the customs and the traditions of man. So what was nailed, what was abolished, is the Jews had this extra dogma which was the customs and the traditions that man had put in place because remember they had all these laws of the sages that had been put in place and that was the commands of man which is the dogma. That was actually nailed. That is what it actually explains in the Aramaic from when I was reading through the Aramaic. So he says that it is the dogma, um, the dogma that has been nailed. It was the this, this commands of man that was actually nailed to the cross. That was what was removed. Not the commands, not the covenant. Imagine, if the covenant would be removed, then the Father's got, then there's no covenant. Mm -hmm. And the covenant, he says, I will make an everlasting covenant forever. Throughout all your generations, the covenant was put in place. We looked at the covenant last week. Mm -hmm. That covenant was made through, forever throughout all your generations. So how does Yeshua come and remove a covenant? It's not possible. Mm -hmm. The only thing he came to remove by his blood was the dogma of the customs and the traditions of man. And the covenant, the covenant that was given, was the covenant that was given on Mount Sinai. And that's the covenant that was given to Moses that he says, if you will obey. In Exodus chapter 19, from verses 5 and 6, it says, if you will obey, you will be my treasured possession. You will be my people. And he says, then I will take care of you. That's what, he's, that's what it's explaining. So, now look at what he says. And to completely restore, now listen, and to completely restore to favor so we become grafted in. You see, Ephesians chapter 2 is just confirming what was spoken in Romans chapter 11 of us being grafted in. So we are being grafted in. The two houses now becoming one house. 
One that was without covenant, now he's been brought into covenant. And what is he doing? Abolishing the dogma of the customs and the traditions of man. That's why Yeshua said to the Pharisees, you have put a heavy yoke upon my people. You have put a heavy yoke, but the yoke of my father is light, which means his laws and his customs and his ways are light. They're light. But their customs and the traditions are the heavy yoke. And that is why in Israel today, most of the Jews do not follow anything. Why? Because it's too difficult. It's too difficult for them to be Jewish because of all the man-made customs and traditions and laws. You've got to have two kitchens. You've got to be able to. You're not allowed to drive on the Shabbat. You're not allowed to switch on a light. You're not, you're not allowed to switch on a light, switch off a light. You're not allowed to press a button of a lift. You're not allowed to tear the toilet paper. You're not allowed to do this. It's, it is just so many rules and regulations that the Jews themselves choose to come away from their, from their religion and they serve nothing because it's too difficult. And that is why Yoshua came to do away from their customs and the traditions and came to bring us back to one covenant, the covenant that was made. That's why it's the renewed covenant that was given to us by his Ruach, that the Jews as well, when they receive the spirit of Yahuwah, they will then be able to flow in the fullness of the Ruach. And this is why he has, Yeshua has brought us back to a covenant that was made that is restoring us back to keeping the Sabbath, Sabbath, keeping his feasts, keeping his ways of eating, keeping all of that that was given. But now, as Christians, we, instead of coming into a covenant, what have we done? We are a branch, a wild olive branch that is sapping of its own and it's not been put into the actual original olive tree. And to completely restore to favor both of them into a lure in one body. You see? Through the stake. So through, the, through what he suffered at the stake. Through the cross of what he suffered. Through the blood that he shed. Having destroyed the enmity by it. And having come. He brought us good news. Peace to you. Who were afar off. And peace to those near. So do you see? It's both for the Gentile. And for the people of Yahuwah. Both for the Jew and for the Gentile. Because the Jews were in bondage. The Jews were far off from the Father. Because they themselves had fallen from being able to keep his ways. That's why, that's why the Father sent us first. John the Baptist as the son. John the Immerser as the son. To bring us to repent. And to turn back to the covenant of the Father that they had lost. Now Yahushua comes as the one who's going to restore us. Then he's going to die and he's going to give us the Ruach of Yahuwah so that there's now the Torah is going to be written upon the tablets of our heart. So there's no more excuse why we're not going to keep it. So he says, because through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Do you see? Through him we both have access to the Father by one Ruach HaKodesh because the Ruach was now given not only for the Gentile, but also for the Jew, if they were to receive Messiah Yeshua. So when they receive Messiah Yeshua, they too receive the Ruach of Yahuwah. So do you see why they need to receive Messiah Yeshua? So that they too can be able to be grafted back into the house. So do you see why there's too a remnant that needs to come from there? So the Father is bringing the remnant out of both the houses. So, so yeah, we will now, we're going to look at, let's just go to Revelation, Revelation 21 so that we can see. Okay. I'm just going to, before we go there, I'm going to read you what it says. Yeah, listen, listen to what it says. Uh, the, I've just found it here in, uh, the, going back, but we're not going to go back. Go to Revelation 21, stay in Revelation 21. I'm just going to read you what the, re, what the Greek says according to Ephesians 2 from, this, uh, uh, from the, the Aramaic Bible. This is the notes that it says. In the Greek it reads, strangers to the co commonwealth of Israel. 
Aramaic reads strangers to the debris of Israel and to the covenant of the promise. Yahuwah identifies Israel according to their obedience to the covenant rather than after the flesh. The renewed covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 and in Hebrews 8, 8 is first made with Israel and Judah and then offered to others from the nations who choose to live in obedience to the covenant. Furthermore, in a very interesting admission, translator John Wesley, okay, he says, polity, uh, uh, polity of Israel, but adds in its footnotes regarding this phrase, the manner or regulations of Israel. In other words, he's looking at the nation's divorcement from the intricate rules of Israel and not some obscure moral delusion of the Torah as a bad thing. This reading might even go beyond one's own re- rendering of citizenship of Israel, but the point is the same. If the Ephesians are citizens of Israel, then they are subject to her words and regulations as well. So if we are citizens of Israel, then that means we are part of the covenant that was made with Israel as well. Do you see? So that is why we need to understand that this was made, we are now grafted in and part of that olive tree. Now, in Revelation 21, verses 12, it says, And having a great and high wall, okay, let's start at verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the set-apart Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from Alua, having the esteem of Alua, and her right was like the most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and having a great high wall, having twelve gates, and at the tw- uh, and the and the gates twelve messengers, and the names written on them, which are those of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So, do you understand? This city that's going to come down has got twelve gates, and on these twelve gates is written the twelve tribes of the house of Israel. So if you, do you under, this is the new Jerusalem going to come down from heaven. So if you're not part of one of those twelve tribes, then how are you going to enter the new Jerusalem that's going to come down from heaven? Do you understand? There's no denomination, yeah. There's no branch called, uh, you know, any denomination. It's not there. Okay. So now we're going to look at, so if we just recap in Isaiah chapter 55, if we go and look, we looked at it last week, in Isaiah 55, it's very clear here that he says with the covenant that he made with David, where he speaks and he says, See, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and the commander to the people. Who is that? Sorry, verse 4. So, okay, let's read from verse 3. Incline your ear and come to, to me here so that your being lives and let me make an everlasting covenant with you. Do you see it's an everlasting covenant that he's making with you, the trustworthy, loving commitments of David, because out of the house of, out of the tribe of David, which is the tribe of Yehuda, was going to come our Messiah, Yehushua. See, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. And who is that witness and the commander? None other than Yehushua himself. And that is the commander and the covenant that he has made. But look at verse 5. See, a nation you do not know, you, who do not know you shall call, and a nation who does not know you run to you because of Yahuwah, your Yahuwah, and the set apart one of Israel, for he has adorned you. And that is part of these Gentile nations that are going to come into that covenant that was made with the house of Israel. So, now we're going to have a look at the last part of this tree. We're going to have a look at 
where the father speaks, it's very important that we need to look at the father speaks about this olive tree in Zechariah verse chapter 4. So we're going to go to Zechariah chapter 4 so that we can understand the prophetic things before we go into this understanding everything about the anointing oil. We need to see this anointing oil flowing from from these trees. And we're going to look at Zechariah chapter 4, which is talking about the messenger. We're going to read from verses 1. So we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 3. It says, And the messenger who was speaking to me came back and woke me up as a man is awoken, awakened from sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I looked and I see a lamp stand, all of gold, with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps, with seven spouts to, to the seven lamps, and two olive trees are by it. One at the right of the bowl, and the other at the left. So there were, it's in Zechariah 4 from verse 1 till 3. So we see that there was seven lamps. I, and see a lamp. So there was, what do you see? I looked and I see a lamp. All of gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven sprouts of, to the seven lamps. So there's seven lamps and this is bringing oil. And then there are two trees on either side of these lamps. And it says, and two olive trees by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So there is one on the right, one on the left. Two trees again. Okay? Now, if we look and we see from verses 13, he, he answered me and said, do you not know what these are? I said, no, Master, because now he says in verse 12, I responded a second time and said to him, what are these two olive branches which empty golden oil from themselves by means of the two golden pipes? And he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my master. And he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the master of all the earth. So, Yah is speaking prophetically it's talking about these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the master of all the earth. So the master of all the earth must be standing in the middle and they are standing on either side. Now it's interesting because if we go to Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17 from verses 1 to 13, so let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Because, yeah, it's not telling you who these anointed ones are. But we are going to be looking at a prophetic picture today. So, Matthew chapter 17 talks about the Mount of Transfiguration. So let's read from verse 1. And after six days, Yoshua took Kepha and Yaakov and Yochanan, his brother, and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transformed before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as the light. And see, Moshe and Eliyahu appeared to them, talking with him. So who is there? And Kepha answering said to Yoshua, Master, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three booths, one for you, one for Moshe, and one for Eliyahu. While he was still speaking, see, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and see, a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, the beloved, in whom I did delight. Hear him. And when the taught ones heard, they fell on their faces and were much afraid. But Yeshua came near and touched them and said, Rise, and do not be afraid. 
And having lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Yahushua only. And as they were coming down from the mountain, Yahushua commanded them, saying, Do not mention the vision to anyone until the son of Adam is raised from the dead. And his taught ones asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say, Eliyahu has to come first? And Yahushua answered and said to them, Eliyahu indeed, indeed coming first, uh, is indeed coming first, and shall restore all. But I say to you that Eliyahu has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. In this way the son of Adam is also about to suffer by them. <laughs> then the taught ones understood that he had spoken to them about Yohanan, the immerser. So now imagine, he is standing on this mountain, and on either side of him, one is standing Moshe, on the other side is standing Eliyahu. Moshe representing what? Moshe representing the, the, the law, the Torah, that which was given to us. Eliyahu representing the prophets, representing the prophets representing everything that comes from the prophetic because the Father speaks to us in spirit and in truth. So we are to be those that are operating in spirit and in truth. Eliyahu representing that which comes from the spirit and Moses representing that which has been given in the Torah. So now, if we go look and see, John the Immerser, was coming as a type of Eliyahu with a message of repent and turn back to what? To the commands, to the ways of the Father. Return, repent, come back to that from where you have fallen. Come back to the ways of the Father. And that's why he was baptized people in the wilderness. But now, if we go look at Malachi chapter 4, If we go to Malachi chapter 4, now, yes, the prophetic things. Now, understand, it was important that Yeshua had to be able to be on the Mount of Transfiguration. They both needed to see the Yeshua that they would have been doing all the work for. Moses spoke about him. Understand, Elijah built the altar of the twelve tribes, wanting to see the restoration of the house of Israel being restored. And now on the Mount of Transfiguration, who are the two that are being appeared to? Who is Yeshua appearing to? Eliyahu and to Moshe. For them to be able to see the fulfillment of the things that were spoken of. Yeshua was there with Moses and with Eliyahu. It was the three, the three disciples. Peter, James, and uh, Yohanan, and John. Peter, James, and John. It was the three that were... So you see, out of the twelve, again there's an inner circle. Do you see the inner circle? So out of twelve, there's three. And those three are the ones that were able to see the transfiguration. Not all the other disciples of the twelve saw it. So do you see what I'm saying? You know, many are called, but few choose. And there's an outer court and there's a holy place. And then there's the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. Then there's the three. And then out of the three, there's John, whom he's going to reveal. The the whole of the book of Revelation is revealed to John, the set-apart one of the Father. So do you see? Father has his... Those who seek him more, those who truly seek him, the more you seek him, the more you're going to find. But that's going to be with a price that you're going to pay, because we will look at this as we go deeper. So, for look, we're going to look at Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. For look, the day shall come burning like a furnace, and all the proud and every wrongdoer shall be stubble, and the day that shall come shall burn them up, says Yahuwah of hosts, which leads to them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, say, do you see? The key is to you who fear my name. The son of righteousness, 
because he's the son of righteousness. He's restoring righteousness back upon the earth. Shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and leap for joy like calves from the store. And you shall trample the wrongdoers, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says Yahuwah of hosts. So you see, this is at the coming of Yahushua when he's going to come. Now listen to what he says. Remember the Torah of Moshe. So yeah, we see, we are being told to remember the Torah of Moshe. Who is appearing on, Mount, on the mountain with Yahushua? Moshe. To remember that we need to return back to the Torah that was given by Moshe, that was given to Moshe. My servant, which I commanded. Who commanded him? So people say, oh, but it's the Torah of Moses. I don't need to keep nothing of Moses. Who commanded him? I commanded him in Horeb. For all Israel, for all Israel, meaning for the 12 tribes of Israel, us included. Laws and right rulings. So do you see? That's not the dogma. That's the laws and the right rulings. That's the instructions for holy living. Now look what he says. See, I'm sending you, Eliyahu, the prophet, before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. So Eliyahu already appeared before the coming of Yahushua the first time as John the Immerser. He came as John the Immerser with the same message as Eliyahu, repent and restoring the house of Israel. Do you understand? And listen to what his message is. He shall turn the hearts of the children and the, 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 the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the earth with utter, utter destruction. Now, there's two ways of looking at the scripture. That he shall turn the hearts of the fathers, Avram, Yitzhak and Yaakov, back to the children. So it's the fathers. Who are the fathers? The fathers of your faith, which is Avram, Yitzhak and Yaakov. Back to the children, the house of Israel. And then he shall turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. So the hearts of the children are being restored back to the fathers of their faith. But there's another way of looking at it. I also say, he's turning the hearts of the children back to the father. Abba, father. And the heart of the father back to the children. And that was the word that the father has released. And you know, just yesterday, I was speaking to a friend of mine in um, the States. And she's a prophet. And the word that the father gave her was that I am bringing back my first love. I'm bringing my people back to the, my first love. And what was the prophetic word that I released of Yah on Shabbat? It was to return back to the first love. And that is the very word that she received from the Father on Yom Teruah. The same night she received that word from Him. I am returning my people back to their first love. It's now coming back to the first love. So you see, there she's sitting in America and she's receiving the exact same confirmation of exactly what the Father gave to me. So, Father must always give me confirmation because, you know, sometimes I'm like one hearing what I hear, but he has already given me confirmation. And you know what else? Kerry Job just released a song that was just at the time, four days ago, which is returning back to the first love. Wow. And so that's why, yeah, we look and we see he's returning us back to his laws, to his right rulings, to his ordinances, which has got to do with everything that comes from the Torah, which is going to have to be his Shabbats, which is going to have to be his commands, which is going to have to be his ordinances that he's put, returning back to his feasts. That's why we're keeping the feasts, returning back to eating according to his word, what he says. That's for holy living. That's for set-apartness. Clean, unclean. If it's clean, you eat. If it's unclean, you don't eat. Because why? Because he says, you are to be set apart. You are to be clean. So if he says it's unclean, then we don't eat it. 
that simple. So if we look now, let's just quickly, um, I'm just getting in my spirit, uh, 1 Kings 18, 1 Kings 18, now look and see what he says, um, here, 1 Kings 18 verses 37, so just go back, verse 36, now we, we, we read this last week about Eliyahu, when he builds the altar and he washes it with water, and now, and we said that he mentioned Yitzhak. So now if you look at 1 Kings 18 verses 36 and 37, listen to what he says. And it came to be at the time of bringing the evening offering that Eliyahu, the prophet, came near and said, Yahuwah, Elua of Avram, Yitzhak, and Israel, let it be known today, you are Elua in Israel, and I, your servant, and done, have done all these matters by your word, Answer me, O Yahuwah, answer me, and let this people know that you are Yahuwah, Alua, and you shall turn their hearts back to you again. So may this be the prophetic word that is released for the season that we are in, especially with this olive that he is turning our hearts back to him again. And this was the word released for Yom Teruah for this time. Father is turning our hearts back to him again. And it's for the house of, he says, Avram, Yitzhak, and Israel. So it's the full house of Israel. And that was the prophetic word given to us. He is restoring us back to the heart of the Father. To that first Love. Amen. Now, if we look at, um, I just want to look at two scriptures before I, 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 because, you know, many people want to turn around and speak about, you know, Moses. Yes, it's the Torah of Moses. But I want you to quickly go have a look at, let's look at Luke chapter 16 first. Go to Luke 16, verses 31. Now, this is about the rich man and the poor man. When Elazar, the rich man and the poor man, and the one dies, the rich man dies and he goes to hell, and the poor man dies, goes to heaven, and now the rich man is sitting and he's speaking to Father Abraham. And from verse 29 he says, Abraham said to him. Now listen to, okay, so if you look and see, let's look at verse 26. And besides all of these, between us, you, there is a great chism. So he's telling them there's a great chism between me and you. We're not going to be able to get, if you are sitting there, you can't come up to where we are. And he says, between has, set, uh, has been set so that those who wish to pass from here to you are unable, nor do those from there pass to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, lest they, sh they also come to this place of torture. Now listen to what Abraham says to him. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So already he's telling him, listen to Moses and the prophets. Because if you listen to Moses and the prophets, you are going to walk righteous. Amen. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they shall repent. Now listen to what he says to them. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither would they be persuaded, even if one should rise from the dead. So do you understand? Already, yeah, this is our New Testament scriptures. And our renewed covenant scriptures is telling us that they, if they don't even listen to Moses and the prophets, how are they going to listen to someone that's going to resurrect from the dead? So Moses and the prophets was important. That's why on the Mount of Transfiguration is Moshe representing the Torah, Eliyahu representing the prophets, because we are to read the books of the prophets and the Torah. So now... Let's look and see in John chapter 5 verse 47. I'm just, you know, it's important that I read these scriptures because this builds a better foundation. 
so that people don't just turn around and say, yeah, but the word says we are to be able to do away with the Torah. This is Yeshua speaking to say that I have not, if you, they don't even listen to Moses and the prophets, why are they going to listen to one who's going to be resurrected from the dead? So he himself was resurrected from the dead, but he didn't come to do away with the Torah, nor, nor Moses and the prophets. He says, I came to fulfill, I came to enhance, I came to expound, I never came to do away with. If anybody teaches that you are to do away with it, they will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5, from verses 17 to 20. So, in John chapter 5, 47 says, But if you do not believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? So look at verse 46. For if you believe Moshe, you would have believed me. Since he wrote about me. There you go. Why did he appear to Moses? Because Moses was writing about him. Moses was revealing to the people about him being the Torah manifested in the flesh. 46 and 47. Matthew 5, 46 and 47. Now do you understand? He was the Torah manifested in the flesh. Yeshua is that olive tree. That is the Torah manifested in the flesh. He is the covenant that we receive. But if you do not believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? Yo, that hit me like anything this morning. If we don't even believe the Torah of Moses, how are we going to have the fullness of the revelation of Yeshua? How? Because he says, how will you then believe my words? So do you understand why there's going to be many that are going to fall? Because when the shaking is going to come, because now we, we're going to look at the shaking that's going to come. So when the shaking is going to come, how are we going to stand? Because the shaking is going to come. And if they have not built their house on a fa- solid foundation, which is on Moses and the prophets, that is what Yeshua would read when, he, we, when we would go to the synagogue. They were reading out of the Torah. They were reading out of the prophets. If we are not going to have a foundation built on that, then the house is not going to stand. Because that's our foundation. Yes, absolutely. Everything is part of the feast. Everything is part of the commands. Everything is part of that. So, now we're going to go look at, I'm now going to take us to look at that Zechariah 14, uh, Zechariah 4.14. We are going to look at that scripture, verses 14, and we're going to see the prophetic behind these two people. Because, wait, first we're going to go to Revelation 11. Let's go to Revelation 11. So when people want to come with their explanation of where they say it's Enoch, and they say, oh, you know, it's Moses and Enoch, and it's this one and that one. The Bible already tells us who these two people are. You know, Scripture interprets Scripture. You can never go and pull something out of somewhere where it's not. Because Scripture interprets Scripture. And you've got to go to the, the place where it was first mentioned. So let's go look and see. Now, in in Revelation 11, from verse 3, it says, And I shall give unto you, unto my two witnesses. Now, did we read in Zechariah that there was two trees that was like two witnesses that were seated, that they were, they were next to the master. These two trees are two people next to the master. So now look and see. I shall give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,260 days clad in sackcloth. So for three and a half years, they are going to speak. These are the two olive trees. Hello, where did we read about the two olive trees? Zechariah 4 verse 3. And the two lampstands that are standing before Lua of the earth. So who are those? Who were the two standing with Yoshua? So Yoshua came in his glory, and in his glory, who was sitting next to on either side of him? Eliyahu and Moshe. So now let's look and see. We are going to establish that it is them. Listen carefully. And if anyone wishes to harm them, fire comes out from their mouth and consumes their enemies. Who was the one calling down fire from heaven? Eliyahu. Eliyahu called down fire from heaven. And if anyone wishes to harm them, he has to be killed in that way. 
These possess, possess authority to shut the heavens. Who shut the heavens when he said there will be no rain? Yeah. Eliyahu. Okay. So that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. So who did that? Eliyahu. And they possess authority over the waters to turn them to blood. Who turned water into blood? Moshe. And to the smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they wish. And when they have ended their witness, the beast coming up out of the pit of the deep shall fight against them and overcome them and kill them. So do you see? Who are these two witnesses? They stand for Eliyahu and for Moshe. Once again, the two witnesses, Eliyahu and Moshe. So, now, if we're going to go look at Zechariah, okay? So, yeah, we've established. These are the two trees, standing for Eliyahu, standing for Moshe. So, it's the Torah and it's the prophets. It's the Torah and it's, it's Moshe and it's Eliyahu. Eliyahu calling down fire from heaven and he shut the heavens. So he calls down fire from heaven and he shuts the heavens. And he's the only one who did that. And who turned water into blood? Moshe. So when people want to come with their theologies and they say to me, Oh, it's Enoch because Enoch was the only one who didn't die. And then it's Elijah because Elijah didn't die. I say, no, 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 wait a second. This is clearly talking about two people who've already done certain things on the earth. So now, if we go look... At Zechariah. Okay, so we go back. Can I, can I ask you something? Is it going to be the actual Moses and Elijah? Okay, we're going to look at this. Because if we go back into looking at the scripture, and that's why I had to go back. I was going to skip this. And the father said, no, you're going to actually go do a word search on this now. So I wasn't even going to mention any of this. But then the father told me, go do a word search. So... Let me get to Zechariah. Okay, so now we're going to take verse by verse of this Zechariah 4, verses 14. So, now we're going to look at, and these are the, are the two anointed ones. Remember, there's two trees. There's two olive trees. We've seen that there's two houses that make one house. Right, anointed. Now we're going to look at this word, anointed. This is the word from the Hebrew, H3323, which is Yitshar. Yitshar. And Yitshar means fresh oil, shining, pure. And that word actually means sons of oil. So that anointed ones means sons of oil. Because when you go look up that word, it tells you there that they are sons of oil. Okay? Which means fresh oil, which means shining, which means pure oil. So you've got to have the pure oil, and you're going to be shining, and you're going to be filled with fresh oil. Okay? Ones. So that's anointed. So ones. What is this ones? Okay? Ones means then, which means son. Which means a male child. Hmm. Male child. In the book of Revelation, it talks about a male child. The male child is going to be taken up. And it talks about the male child also being Yeshua is the male child. So, but it also means <laughs> children. Male and female. It means children. So, it's not only just meaning one. It means children. Which means sons of Yah, which means stars, which means sparks, which means arrows, which means anointed, which means appointed, which are the firstborn. So who are these people? Wow. Now we're seeing a different understanding. So as much as there can be two people, it is also looking at as if it can be a group of people. And this, I, I've always believed that there will be two witnesses. Mm. But when I had to, Father said to me, go and do a word, word search, my child, and you are going to get a deeper revelation. Because I have been busy with this for a long time. And I've, and I've heard teachings, 
but I don't want to be swayed by people's teachings. And that's why I'm saying, Abba, you give me the revelation. You give me the understanding so that I may understand because I've heard many teachings that it's going to be the remnant that's going to be able to stand, that's going to be bringing down the fire, exactly like Moses and Elijah. But then I thought, but it's speaking about two people. But he says, but where does it come from? It comes back from Zechariah. And this is now talking about a bigger group of people. Now look at this. They stand. Now look at the stand. Wow. This one blew me away. Stand is the number H5975. Okay. Which is the word Ahmad. Ahmad. And this means Ahmad. And this means to stand. <laughs> Who are those going to stand? Okay, listen carefully. To stand, to remain, to endure, to take one stand. Being standing, being a standing attitude, to take a stand, to become a servant of. And isn't it interesting? The book of Revelation is wrote, written for the servants of Yahuwah. So who are these servants? They are the remnant. Okay. To become a servant of. To abide. We are called to abide in Him. To endure. To persist. Be steadfast. Hold, hold one's ground. To be upright. To arise. Ha! Ah, arise and shine for your light has come. For the glory of you who has risen upon you. Great darkness will cover the earth. But they will come to the brightness of your light. So who are these that are going to arise? They are those that are going to take the stand. They are those that are going to have to stand. They are those that are going to be filled with the oil. They are those that are going to be filled with his anointing. They are those that are going to be the stars. They, it says that those who are going to bring many to righteousness, they will shine as the stars of the heavens. In Daniel it says. So who are these? Yeah, we're going to look, we're going to see, we're going to see, it's all going to unfold. I get excited, let me get excited, I'm excited now. To appear, so they will be to arise, to appear, come on the scene. They're going to come on the scene. This was amazing because they're going to come on the scene. So, is there going to be a story and they're going to come? And I just prophesied on Shabbat that I said, greater works are we going to do because we are going to be translated and the Father is going to have us to be used to do the greater work that we need to do. So who is this body? Who is this company? Who are these people? Who are these? Hmm. So, no. They, hmm? No, we're not. We shall be... We will shine for all to see. They are, or, they are ordained. They are established. So they are ordained and they are established. Now listen, in the whole, they are those who abide. They are those that are appointed. They are those that arise. They are those that endure. They are those that they, are, they serve. They are those that stand fast and they are firm. That's who they are. Now, that's when I looked at this and I said, sure, Abba, this can't just be speaking about Moses and Eliyahu. Because it's the spirit of Eliyahu that is going to be released in the hour of turning the children back to the Father. The spirit of Eliyahu is the ones that is being able to, pro to speak the message of bringing the children from the, back to the ways of the Father back to Avram, Isaac, and Yaakov coming back into covenant, coming back into Torah. And that is those that are raising up now whom the Father is using to be able to do the greater work in this hour. So this is a company of people the way I understand it when I see they're the sons of oil. They are the sons of oil. So now we're going to see the olive produces oil. So, who are these sons and what must they go through? Ha. Because, sure, if we want to be these that are going to have to stand, because it says they stand 
beside the master. And they will come when the master comes. He gathers them out of the four corners of the earth and they will come with him. His faithful ones that are going to have to overcome. Who are this overcoming? Who are these faithful ones that have had to stand? So we will look at the olive. So the olive, we looked at yesterday, the Hebrew word olive is zayit, meaning an olive, meaning yielding, illuminating oil, it relates to the word ziv, meaning to be prominent and reflect brightness, to bring about brightness. So do you see, do you see, did you see where it says they will arise, those who will arise and shine. Do you see Isaiah 60 verses 1 and 2 coming into fulfillment? They have to arise and shine because his glory, what is the glory? The glory is the anointing, which is the oil. And that's what we're going to look at today. And that's why the Father said to me, today we are returned to with gold to reflect his glory. Because it's about being able to reflect the glory. So, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 27 verse 20. Yes, so, so he says, you are like an arrow in my, those that are in my quiver, the, what, how does it go, Isaiah 54, it is it? In the quiver, yeah. quiver. It's, the, it's the arrows, wait, Isaiah, I think it's in Isaiah. Mm -mm. Not on, no, no, it's also in, in Isaiah. Um, um, for your maker is your... Okay, let me see. Um, I called you like a woman. Isaiah uh, no. 49.2 talks about I am like a sharp arrow. Isaiah 49.2 I'm not like a sharp yeah. sword and... Yeah. But there's one, I will f just look and see that we will be like arrows and no weapon formed against us. So the one that says, where's that scripture, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It's that one that says, no, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. But he talks about... Yeah, you shall tell you Isaiah 54. Yeah, no weapon formed against you shall prosper and every tongue that raises up in... Okay. But before that, he talks about how we are, oh, it doesn't matter. It's the one that he talks about that we will be like arrows in his quiver. Yeah. And the daughter's like pillars in the That's wrong. Okay, but it doesn't matter, it's that scripture. I know that it's in Isaiah as well. That's Psalm 127 4. Yeah, that's right. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, children born in one yeah. seed. Yeah. Okay. Well, we just got to Exodus chapter 27, which is no, where we're going to go. Just listen to Psalm 127 4. For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country. Sorry, I just want to get through. Um, hmm. Sorry, I haven't opened the whole one. Let me just go back. Sorry, carry on. Let me no, it's fine. Let me, let's just read Isaiah 27 verse 2 and it says, And you shall make it... Um, no, sorry, Exodus. 27. 27 verse 20, sorry. Exodus 27 verse 20. And you, are to and you, you are to command the children of Israel to bring you clear oil. My Bible says clear, but we're going to look at this word clear. To bring clear oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. So you see, we are to be able to burn continually. And we are to be able to bring what? A pure oil. Because that word is Pure. That word, pure, yeah, clean oil, yeah, pure. And that is the word zak, which is H2134, which means, listen to what it means. It means clear, it means pure, it means righteous, and it means pure one. 
So it means clean, it means pure, it means righteous, and it means pure one. So we are to be pure and we are to be righteous. Now in the pomegranate, we covered everything about righteousness. And it comes from H2141, which is Zakak, 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 to be pure, be bright, be clean, be shining, to be cleansed, and make clean. From Zakak. And that means to be pure, to be bright, to be clean, to be shining, to be cleansed, and to make clean. So do you see, it's not just a case of having an anointing. What makes you have oil? The thing that's going to make you have oil, the thing that's going to make you shine, is the fact that you have to be able to be pure. You have to be able to be clean. You have to be able to allow yourself to be cleansed. And that was the pure oil that went into the menorah. And what does the menorah symbolize? Yeshua himself. So if that oil is the menorah, is the oil that's going into the menorah, it can only be pure oil. Now, if we are the vessel that is carrying Yeshua, then that means we are to carry the pure oil. Because only pure oil can go into Yeshua. Which means that we are to be the righteous. That we are to be the pure ones. That we are to be the clean. So do you understand? If people say, but I can still eat this food. If he says, this is the foods for holy living. Clean, unclean. If he calls it unclean, then if you eat it, it will make you unclean. Which means, how do you carry Yeshua's presence if you're still going to be eating what is unclean? Because remember, we are the tabernacle that now carries his presence. If he wouldn't have it in his, would he eat that that was unclean? If he kept Torah 100%, would he eat it? No. So why would we? Do you understand? Do you understand how we need to come to deeper revelation? This is the deeper revelation. We're all on a path. It's not to say everybody's arrived, but we've got to get there. Do you understand? He's cleaning us. That's why he says he's changing us from glory to glory because we've been cleaned. And the feasts and Sabbath helps us. Absolutely. To keep the right company. That's right. Absolutely. Okay. And it comes from? Right. Now we're going to look at oil. What does the word oil mean? Oil is the word shemen. That's H8081. Shemen. Oil. Shemen. Now that oil is the fat. It's fatness. It's anointing. So you see when they say they were fat, it means they are anointed. They are fruitful. They are rich. And they are oiled. That's what oil means. Shemen. 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 So it's fatness, it's oil, it's anointing. It's fruitful. Now do you understand why we've got to be fruitful? Do you understand why he's giving us the seven fruits of the land so that we may understand? Is our tree bearing fruit? Because he wants fruitfulness. He wants richness. Then beaten. So we need to be beaten. And that word beaten is the word katiyit. 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 And it is beaten out. It is pure. It is pounded fine. <laughs> it is the oil that is pressed in the mortar, in the olive press. It is costly. And it is pure oil. It's costly. Pure virgin olive oil is costly. It's not cheap. You can go buy the cheap one. But the pure virgin one is costly. And then it is light. And interesting, that word light is H3974, which is Meorah. Now look at Menorah. It comes from Meorah. Or meaning light, but it's Meorah. And that is light, luminary, brightness, cheerfulness. The oil of joy for the spirit of heaviness. 
And the joy of Yahuwah is our strength. And that was the other word that the Father released for now. He's giving us this joy, which is going to become our strength. And so even though we're going to be beaten, even though we're going to go through this oil press, we will have joy. Because it's cheerfulness. It's bright light. It's to give light. It's to shine. And it comes from the word or, which is light, to shine, to become bright, to give light, to make shine, glorious, set on fire, shine. So now look at when people say, you have the fire. The more of, the, the more of his anointing of his oil, you will be set ablaze. On fire. So how can you contain that? Which is a blaze. You cannot. Because it will come forth. But. Now we are going to understand this. A little bit deeper. So you see. We want the anointing. But what does it take? What is the process of the olives? For the olives to be taken down the tree. It has to be shaken vigorously. (laughs) Or it is beaten, causing the olives to fall to the ground. So first it's going to be shaken. So he's going to shake everything that is not of him out of you. So we are going to be shaken. And then whatever olives remain will be beaten with a stick. You, I tell you, That sounds like my Messiah. He was beaten with a whip to a pulp for him to be able to become the anointing for us. But do you see how contrary it is that we want an anointing but we want to go through nothing? Oh, that one is impossible, I tell you now. It's impossible. Because yeah, we're going to see it in its fullness. So the olive trees were beaten with poles to drop to the ground. Once gathered, they are put in an olive press by using a stone press to grind them. Then the beaten oil is used, which is the purest oil that comes first. Okay. In Isaiah 17 verses 5 to 6, it says, 17, yeah, so see, it's already in the Word, so that we can see that it's in the Word, that this beating and shaking of an olive tree is in the Word. Isaiah 17, verses 5 to 6, and it says, And it shall be as when the harvester gathers the grain, and reaps the heads with his arm, and it shall be as he gathers the heads of grain in the valley of Raphaim, And gleaning grapes shall be left in it, like the shaking of an olive tree, two or or three olives at the top of the uttermost branch, four or five in the most fruit-bearing branches, declares Yahuwah, Elua of Israel. So do you see? And the gleaning of the grapes and the shaking of the olive tree, two olives. All three olives at the top of the utmost branch. Four or five in its most fruitful bearing branches. So it will shake and it will have those left. And that's when they take the, 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 the sticks and then they beat them for the rest of them to be able to fall down for those that don't come off with the shaking. So, therefore, Abba is going to shake us. He will allow us to be beaten so that we will fall to the ground then we will go through an oil press. The oil was then used to light up the menorah. So now let's look and see. We need to be shaken so our lives begin to change. So let's look at the process. We need to be shaken so that our lives begin to change. Until the shaking comes, nobody changes. Did you see all of a sudden the shaking came with COVID-19? As the shaking came, people started not being able to go to church. Now, people started gathering at home and started having to read their Bibles for themselves. And they started having to realize that, wait a second, I, might, I have to come to find the Father for myself now. 
but the shaking had to come first. Yes. Once the shaking comes, it will start to bring us to change. Then we are beaten down. The beaten down is the humbled. We need to be humbled. We need to suffer. We need to be afflicted. We need to be crushed. We need to be bruised in order to produce the fruits of righteousness. So fruits of righteousness don't just form of itself. Fruits of righteousness comes from those that are going to have to be humbled. Which means your arrogance and pride is going to get you nowhere. If you're going to stay, if the shaking comes and you stay in your arrogance and your pride and you're not willing to humble, you will stay where you are. Because you have to go low. You've got to go low so that he may be lifted up. You must go low. So he's going to humble you. So what was the first process? The first process was the shaking. Now we're going to start being humbled. Because we are going to maybe have to run from our houses, run you know, lose our possessions, lose our things. We are going to come to a very humble frame. Yes. When the food is not there and things are not there, we are being humbled. We are being brought down. We will have to suffer. We will be afflicted. We are going to be crushed. We are going to be bruised yes. in order to produce the fruit of righteousness. Yes. The good first fruits of the olive press. So then we become the first fruits offering because it's the first fruits of that first oil that's pressed. That is the virgin olive oil that comes forth. And so the Father has to allow us to go through all of this so that we can become those first fruits. So who are the first fruits that are going to appear on Mount Sinai, I mean Mount Zion with Yeshua? They are the first fruits. Those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Those are the ones that were spoken of those two trees, those olive trees that are going to have the oil coming forth from them, being able to give the oil to those that are going to come around. But what do they have to go through? So we are going to see that this olive press is a process of extracting the oil to be able to light the menorah. Who is this menorah? Who represents the menorah? Yeshua is the representative the menorah represents Yeshua, who is the light. He is the light of the world, and he is the word becoming flesh. That's Yeshua himself. And in Proverbs 6, verse 23, let's see what Proverbs 6, verse 23 says. Proverbs 6 verse 23. Proverbs 6 verse 23 says, For the command, for the command is the lamp and the Torah is the light. So now I'll ask you something. How do you have oil that's the light without the commands and without the Torah? The commands is the lamp and the law, the Torah is the light. And that's your sure himself. Because he became the light of the world. And his word is the light unto our feet. In Psalm 119 verses 105. So, he, the oil that goes into the menorah is the olive oil. It is the purest heart-pressed oil. So, through his trials, Yeshua, he became the oil, his olive oil. And he became, he had to go through the olive press, which was the garden of Gethsemane. So do you see his word? We, if we look over here again at Proverbs 6 verse 23, it says the command, the command is the lamp and the Torah is the light and reproves of discipline a way of life. So how do you reprove anybody in discipline if you do not have the Torah of Yahuwah? Yes. That's why the Torah is the instructor. It instructs us. That's why it's the instructions for set-apart living, for holy living, for set-apart living. And so how do we have that? With, so how do we have Yahshua without having Torah if Yahshua is the light? And that is the olive oil. How? It's impossible. So... In the Garden of Gethsemane, okay, Gath in, in Hebrew means press, the oil press. Shemini, 
Um, so, gaff is to press the oil, and shemini is oil press. So, he goes to Gethsemane, which is the oil press. So, when we think of the Garden of Gethsemane, it is the oil press that Yeshua went to. So, we too have to go to our Garden of Gethsemane. Mm-hmm. Our Garden of Gethsemane is where we are going to be persecuted mm-hmm. by those that are going to want to arrest us, mm-hmm. that are going to want to put us in jail which is what Yeshua speaks. He says, some of you will be thrown in jail. You will be tested and trial 10 days. We're going to look at that scripture when we close off. And so, at the end of the day, we too are going to have to go through a Garden of Gethsemane experience in our lives, where we too are going to be afflicted, where we too are going to have to be heart-pressed, where we too are going to pray a prayer and the Father is not going to answer. What does Gethsemane stand for? It means olive press. Gath? Gath, which is press oil, and Shemani, olive press. So it is an olive press. It is the pressing of the oil. (coughs) Now, if you look and see, Yeshua prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane. The oil press goes through a process of three phases. You've got your first oil, which is the pure virgin. Then you've got your next press, which is the not so pure, and you've got your third one. But he prayed three times and asked the Father to remove the cup from him. And yet he had to go through the full olive press. Because even for the one that is not first fruits, he's still there for them. And the next one. So the purest one is the first virgin one that comes out. But then from that it goes and it's pressed some more. Until you get your very last one, which is where really what they use for the washing. Like you get your soaps, your olive oil soaps, comes from your last bit of the olive oil. Because my gran used to, um, you know, we have olive tree plantation in Portugal, and this is what she used to do, make olive oil, and she used to make olive oil soap and everything. So... I remember my mom used to tell me that her gran used to take that last bit of the olive oil, the last bit at the bottom, the luck, the, the love mm. that was left. And that's what you then make the olive oil, the, the soap out of. So, <coughs> Yoshua himself, in the Garden of Gethsemane, prayed three times. Mm. And as, as the olive press has got a three process that it goes through. And so, we need to understand that He was crushed. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, He was crushed for our iniquities. So we too will be crushed. So we need to be crushed for Him to get the purest oil from us so that the first fruits of our life can be offered for Him. Let me repeat that again. So we need to be crushed for Him To get the purest oil from us so that the first fruits of our life can be offered for him as the first fruits offering for him. Okay, now we're going to look at these virgins. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 25 from verse 1. Matthew chapter 25 from verse 1 to 13. Okay. Then the reins of the heaven shall be compared to ten maidens, ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish, having taken their lamps, took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their containers with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom took time, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, See, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those maidens rose up 
and trim their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, because our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, indeed, there would not be enough for us and you. Instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later the other maidens also came, saying, Master, Master, open up for, for us. But he answering said, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Have you heard that one before? Yeah. I don't know you. Watch therefore, because you do not know the day nor the hour in which the son of Adam is coming. Okay, so now we are going to look at this parable, understanding the oil press. So if we understand the oil press, we will understand the five foolish virgins from the five wise virgins. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, how do we obtain the pure oil? Mm -hmm. You are going to have to be shaken. Okay, what did we say? We're going to have to be shaken. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to be beaten. And we're going to have to be humbled. Mm -hmm. So the shaking is to change our lives. So those, um, those wise virgins, the oil that they obtained was because they were willing to allow themselves to be shaken. Once they were shaken, they were then al allowed themselves to change. So, they are producing oil because they have been shaken. And now they start to change. Then they start to be beaten, which means... They will allow themselves to allow the Father to humble them in their character, allow themselves to go through many things because it comes with our character. It comes with our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. There are certain things of our lifestyle that the Father wants to change. So he brings a shaking and then he starts to change us. Like with me. Oh, Father. Oh, my goodness. It's like strip. And if you haven't stripped, I'm going to strip you a bit more. And if you haven't stripped, I'll strip you a bit more. And we are still being stripped a bit more. And so I will shake you a little bit more. And I will remove from you a little bit more. Because I need you to be humbled. I need you to suffer. So there are times that we're going to suffer for things that we didn't even do. Like when cancer came upon my body, that was a suffering that, what the heck? What the heck did I do to be able to get, to get a cancer in my body? But yet it came. But he said to me, the sickness will not end in death, but it will be for the glory and the honor of my name. There are some sufferings that we have to go through, like you right now are suffering for a suffering that is going on in your body, that sometimes we have allowed things to come in within ourselves, but that suffering is going to bring about what? It's going to bring about a bitterness that's going to bring about an anointing. That's going to come forth. But now do you see, we don't want to be afflicted with anything. We don't want to be crushed. We don't want to be bruised. We don't want to suffer anything. And we don't want to be humbled. But we want to be anointed. But we want to be the five wise virgins. So no wonder the foolish virgins came to the wise virgins and said, Give me your oil. What did the wise virgins say? How do I give you an oil that I paid for with my life? How do I give you oil that I have suffered for? How do I give you an oil that I have paid for with my life? Yes. I have allowed myself to be humbled. I have allowed myself to be afflicted. I have said to the Father, change me, Abba, my Father. And that brings about more things in my life. Abba, do not keep me where I am, Abba, my Father. Please, will you change that character in me? Father, I, I don't like this thing in me. Oh, don't worry. Do you want patience? Okay, don't worry. I'll put you in another test, and I'll put you through another trial until I eventually gain to birth patience out of you. Do you need peace? Oh, okay, don't worry. I'm going to take you out of the city. I'm going to bring you to this place that you can find a little bit of peace in your life. Do I like this piece in, in the beginning? No, I did not. I didn't like the sound of the chicken. I didn't like the sound of the rooster. I didn't like the sound of all these things around me. I was used to the sound of the city. Just like when they came this weekend, it was like, sure, this is different sounds. Not used to a rooster crowing at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know? 
You're not used to that kind of sound. <clears throat> but you see, it's different sound. Mm-hmm. And now you need a humble in your flesh. Yes. Oh my goodness, I don't have all the nice luxury things that I had while I was staying in my apartment, but it's okay. Go without a few things and it will be fine. But you see, we don't want to go without anything. We want to pray every little thing away. And we are spoiled brats. That's what we are. But then we want the anointing. Oh no, wait a second. I'm going to go to this this conference and I'm going to rub up against that anointed woman and I'm going to get her anointing. I've got news for you today. You cannot acquire someone else's anointing. You have to pay for it with your own price. Of course we do, because this is the things we've been told. And we think we are the wise virgins. We all think we are the wise wise virgins because we are these believers and we are the wise virgins. He tells you clearly, I don't know you. Why don't I know you? Because I don't live within you. You have not allowed me to manifest myself through you, to be the light that must shine through you. You have no light that shines of yourself. The only light that you have that shines of you is his light. He is the anointed one who is going to shine forth from you. And the more you humble, the more you go down, the more he raises up. Less of you, more of him. More of you, less of him. But that takes a breaking. That takes affliction. That takes a humbling. That takes me saying I'm sorry when I don't really want to say I'm sorry because at the end of the day, I didn't really do anything wrong, Abba. But yet at the end of the day, go and apologize because it's not as right, it's not as wrong, it's too humble. But I didn't do anything wrong, Abba. Now if you really look, you'll see that there is something there that you've done because you have an arrogant heart. Because if you can say you're sorry, then that means you're humble. If you can't say you're sorry, you've got no humility. It's that simple. Humility is to be able to say, I'm sorry. It takes, do, you, do you know how difficult it is to say, I'm sorry? Very difficult. Think about that one carefully. And that is why the Father's got to humble us by breaking us down. And now do you understand why he's anointed set apart ones, these, these ones that we spoke about in Zechariah? These ones that we spoke about in the book of Revelation that are going to be the, the ones that are going to have to stand. What do you think you're just going to stand for? You don't, you, you, you don't need to go through anything to stand. To stand means that you're going to stand for something. Knowing what you stand for limits what you fall for. So you're either going to fall for something or you're going to stand for something. So to stand for something means you're going to have to stand for truth, which means you will not bow your knee. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego stood for the fact that they would not bow to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. But what did that mean for them? Thrown in the fire furnace. Thrown in the furnace of fire. And what did he say to them? O king, we know that our Yahuwah will save us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow to your statue. So we will go into the furnace. And there came a fourth man in the furnace with them. There, is, there was Daniel. What did Daniel have to do? Did he go through an oil press? Oh, there was Daniel. Daniel decided, okay, I'm not going to be able to go and close the curtains and be, you know, shy of what I believe. So three times a day, I, I have to bow and pray, do my prayers. I'm going to open up my curtains. I'm going to show everybody that I'm going to still pray three times a day. And I'm not going to fear anybody. And in the midst of that, if they want to arrest him, let me. Let them arrest me. And they did. And he was thrown in the lion's den. Did he, was he spared of the lion's den? No, he was not spared of the lion's den. He was thrown in the lion's den. But in the lion's den, the father closed the lion's mouth. And therefore, he came out of there. And but both times, who was seen as being victorious? Yahuwah. He was magnified. The Yah of Daniel has saved him from the lion's den. And then Nebuchadnezzar, when he turned around and he saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he says, who is that fourth man in the, in the fire with him? Who is that? Then he saw that that was the Yah of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm. And then he exalted his name and saw him to be the only Yah. Mm. So do we see what is it going to take for us to truly be an anointed one? Yes. That's right. Mm. Esther had to humble. She said, if, I perish, if I perish, I perish. But I am going to stand before the king even when I'm not summoned to stand before the king. Mm. And yet she had an enemy that went wanting to kill her. Mm. So, at the end of the day, do you know what? 
The enemy will bow before us if we will be able to stand for Abba Yahuwah. And that was the answer to my dream last night that I received this now. I received when we were worshipping. The enemy will come and they will bow before you and they will lick your face and they will come and bow before you because you will stand for me. And that's what we need to do in the hour that we're in. Knowing what we're going to stand for is going to limit what we fall for. So are we these wise virgins? Are we these wise virgins that is allowing ourselves to be filled with oil? So that our oil will not run out. Because the oil that we will have, we will be able to take our oil with us. Because our oil is the anointing that is flowing forth from us constantly, constantly, constantly. Who is the presence of Yeshua living within us? Why did he say to the foolish, foolish, foolish virgin, I don't know you because I don't live within you. My oil is not being manifest in out of you. I am not the one living within you, pouring my oil out from you. Do you understand? I don't dwell within you. I don't know you. You are going to run out of oil because your oil is of your own making. It's not mine. It's not me. So, it was not enough, exactly, because they thought their works that they're doing and their things that they're doing, when all of that comes to an end, when the persecution starts and the things start, we are going to see who's going to stand. Because that oil was the same oil. It's the same oil. But it was just not It was not enough. Why? Because at the end of the day, when the persecution is going to come, who is going to stand? Because the anointed ones are the ones that are willing to stand. They are the ones that are the anointed sons. They are the oiled. What did, what did I say? They are the sons of oil. They are manufacturing the oil. Why? Because they are those shining with the pure oil. They are the ones that stand. They are the ones that abide. They are the ones that are appointed. They are the ones that endure. They are the ones that serve. They are the ones that stand fast. They are the ones that are firm in who he is. And because of that, they are the ones that have the oil running through them. The others do not. That's right. The oil is not going to run out. Because remember, that pure oil was to allow that menorah to be lit all the time. It had to produce the light. That's what we read. That oil was to continue burning. The menorah was to continue burning. So that oil had to continue being put in that menorah. So if you're sure is that menorah, that oil is being poured within him constantly. And who dwells in us now? You're sure. So if that oil is being poured in him, the less there is of us, the more there is of him, the more the anointing of that oil is coming forth. And the more we shine. Because what is the oil? It's shining. It's to shine. It's to be bright. And we will be cheerful. So if we go look at Revelation chapter 2, so now let's go look at, if we link this up to a church in the book of Revelation, like we linked up the other one to the, pom the pomegranate to the church of, Phil of Philadelphia, we can link up this one to the church of Smyrna, which is the other faithful church. Because remember, there were two faithful churches, not just one faithful church. The church of Philadelphia was faithful, but so was the church of Smyrna. Now let's look at the church of Smyrna from Revelation 8 to 11. And to the messenger of the assembly of Smyrna writes, the, This says the first and the last, who became dead and came to life. I know your works. And pressure. So do you see? Are we going to go through pressure? That word pressure means, it means slipsis, which means affliction. Which means they were being afflicted. Which means pressure. Okay? So I know your pressure. I know your slipsis. And poverty. So you, these people didn't even have money. Yet you are rich. So you see, did we read that, that part of this, um, part of standing, part of this oil is richness. Yes, we did. We read that the rich, the oil has to do with richness. Yeah, shemem, which is oil. It's fat. It's oil. It's fatness. It's anointing. It's fruitful. It's richness. It's oiled. So even though they were poor, they were rich. 
Yet you are rich, and the blas and the blasphemy of those who say they are Yehudim, who say they are Jews, and are not, but are a congregation of Hasatam. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. So you see, if you're going to have to suffer affliction, if you're going to have to suffer going through a, a, a lack of food, whatever we have to suffer, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. See, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. So there might be some of us that are going to have to be put in prison. We don't, we don't know. Because of what we stand for. We don't know. In order to try you, and you shall have pressure, you shall have flipsis, you shall have persecution, you shall have affliction, ten days. Be trustworthy until death. So even if it means that they have to put us to death, we will not bow our knee. We will be those that will stand. And I shall give you the crown of life. Praise Abba Father. That crown of life is in James 1.12. If we endure, we receive the crown of life for those who love him. So you will receive the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assembly. He who overcomes. So do you see what are we going to need to do? Overcome. He who overcomes shall by no means be harmed by the second death. So you see, if we're going to die for our faith, and we have to overcome, no matter what happens, and we die for our faith, we will be those that will not go through this, this great throne judgment of the second death. Amen? So, James 1, we can, I'll quickly read there from James 1. James 1 says, Blessed is the man who does endure trial. So you see, are we going to have to endure trial? Yeah. It's part of our anointing. Blessed is the man who endures trial. For when he has been proven, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Master has promised to those who love him. So do you see? The, who, are the, who are the five virgins? I know, they are those whom he loves. Those who love. Um, they are those who love him. And those are the five virgins that will have the oil. Because they are not going to succumb to the things of this world. They're not going to bow. They are going to endure the trials that are going to come. They are going to stand. This is part of the remnant bride. So, let us close off by looking at this word. Olive, which is the Zait, so we can understand the prophetic revelation behind this olive, and what is our prophetic revelation for us. So the olive is the word in Hebrew Zait, Zait, which is made up of a Zayin, a Yud, and a Tav. The Zayin means to plow, it means a weapon, it means cut, it means sword, it means tool. The yud, the yod, is the hand, is the work, is the deed, is the worship. The tav is the cross, is the mark, is the sign, is the covenant. So all of that is tied in to the olive. So listen to the prophetic. We must allow ourselves to be cut, to be plowed, to become a weapon, a sword, the arrow, a tool for Abba's work, a tool in his hand for worship. Because we need to be a mark, a sign, a cross, of his covenant. Amen. Let's read it again. So what is the olive? We must allow ourselves to be cut, to be plowed, to become a weapon, a sword, a tool for Abba's work, a tool in his hand. For worship, 
because we overcome by the power of the blood and the word of his testimony. And how do we overcome on Shabbat? The message that I brought was a worshipping people. We need to worship. Worship your way through the wilderness. And worship. It was when they worshipped and they blew their shofars and they went around the walls of Jericho seven times. Those walls came crashing down. So we need to be a worshipping people. So we continue to worship even through the destruction. So we are a tool for Abba's work in his hand for worship. Because we need to become a mark, a sign, a cross of his covenant. So that people can see his covenant through the way that we live our lives. So are we a sign of the covenant of where we keep the feasts, of where we keep the Sabbath, of the way we eat, so many people cannot read the Bible, but we need to be covenant people that we become a sign for others by the way we reflect ourselves. So do we reflect the character of Yoshua? Do we reflect the Torah of Abba Yahuwah? Do we reflect who he is? Do we allow ourselves to go through the oil press to become that sign? Because Yoshua became the covenant for us. All of this is Yoshua. Yoshua was, is our weapon. He's, he's our sword. He's the tool. He's the plow. That's Yoshua. Yoshua, he was nailed. His hands were nailed so that he did the work so that we could come back to worship for the Father. He became the cross. He became the mark. He became the sign of the everlasting covenant. Now we are to become that as Yahushua lives in us and through us, the hope of glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abba Father. Oh, Abba, thank you, my Father, for your awesome word of the revelation and truly understanding what it means to be able to have the fruit of an olive, to become that oil, to be the real virgins the five wise virgins. How do we acquire wisdom? To acquire wisdom. The fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of wisdom. So what made them wise? What made them wise was the fact that they feared you. And that is coming back to your ways. What did you say on Mount Sinai? On Mount Sinai you said, Moses said to the people when you were speaking your commands, you said to them, do not fear. He puts his fear in you so that you no longer sin, so that we may live before him. But instead, they chose to have it written on tablets of stone, and they chose to listen to a man. But Father, that was never your will. Your will was to be able to give us your Ruach HaKodesh that would write the Torah upon our hearts so that we could become signs of your covenant for the nations of the world to be able to see you. Father, I pray that we could become those signs of your covenant. I pray that we could become the weapons of your doing, weapons of where we can be able to use our mouths to be able to become like a sword with your word in it that needs to come forth. Father, I pray that we will have wisdom, that we will be those wise virgins. Why were the others foolish? Because they were not willing to surrender. They were not willing to submit. They were not willing to go through an oil press because you went through an oil press and you said in your word, no servant is greater than their master. So if we are servants... That is who the book of Revelation was written to. Then we too will be willing to go through our Gethsemane. And we too will be willing to go to a cross. To the stake of where we too will be willing to humble. So that we will allow ourselves to be, go through an olive press. To be able to die in our flesh. Where you said if you want to follow me. You need to deny yourself. You need to pick up your cross, your stake, and follow me. And so as you walked, I'm called to walk. 
as you went through your Gethsemane, I am called to go through a Gethsemane. So I pray, Father, that you will start to shake your people. Shake. That you have to shake the nations of the world. As you've spoken in Haggai, I will shake the nations of the world as you have declared in more than one of the books of the prophets that you need to shake us. And then you're going to be able to put us through this beaten. We need to be like the menorah that needs to be beaten so that pure gold can come forth. And that was the church of, of Laodicea, that they, they were not willing to buy the pure gold because we need to be refined by fire seven, seven times seven so that we may be able to come out like gold. We must be refined by the fire. And I pray that that fire is the fire of your Ruach, because that's what the oil is. It's like fire, and it burns. But it's going to burn the dross to bring out life, so that we may truly shine for your light. But I pray, Abba, allow us, give us the grace. As Abba, we truly need your grace. We need your grace to help us where we have been so deceived to pray away all kind of affliction and to pray away all kind of hardships and trials as opposed to being able to ask, Father, is this of your doing? Is this your doing? Then help me to stand and overcome. So, Father, I pray, give us the discernment that we need in the hour that we are in, that we will be those that will be faithful, that we will be those that will stand, that we will be those that will, not, that will not bow down to the enemy, but that the enemy will flee because of us being vessels that will be anointed and appointed by you for these final last days that we find ourselves coming into, where this hourglass is so quickly running out, where the, the one minute to midnight is already on the clock. But I pray, Father, that you give us the grace and that we will truly be those that will shine like the firmaments of the heaven, that we will be those stars that will be able to turn many to righteousness in these last days and that we will truly be those that will arise and shine for our light will have come, for your glory will be seen upon us and even though great darkness is going to cover the earth, they will come to the brightness of the light that will shine forth from us because we will be your beaten vessels to reflect your pure, your glory that will be able to flow with pure anointing oil. In Yeshua's name we pray this. Amen. Amen.